Madhrahim, today we will be going to discuss the topic of obstetric cholestasis from RCOG guideline basically. Okay, when you, um, you talk about the study material for obstetric cholestasis, I would recommend that uh, it would be best if you study it from RCUJ guideline first. And then there's a talk article as well for obstetric cholestasis. And evidence-based textbook of obstetric and gynecology is also a very good source of study for the topic of obstetric cholestasis. But basically, you get a lot of information from RCUJ guideline. And if you study the recommended summary uh, from the RCOG guideline, then you will get a very uh, good understanding of this topic. Okay, so background. Background is written in this uh, guideline and uh, we are studying this background because there are some important percentages written in this background. So uh, it's very important to give um, a look at these percentages as well. <clears throat> So, obstetric cholestasis, which is also referred as uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy, affects 0.7% of pregnancy in multi-ethnic population and 1.2 to 1.5% of the Indian Asians or Pakistani Asians women. Now, uh, about origin, I would like to say that the prevalence is influenced by genetic and environmental factors and varies between populations. Now, worldwide, for example, in child, 2.4% of all pregnancies are affected with a 5% prevalence in a woman of Asian uh, Indian origin. Okay, so in child, 2.4% and 5% in Asian Indian origin women. Okay, and uh, that uh, uh, in overall, it affects 0.7% of the pregnancies. Okay, now uh, coming to the risk factors for obstetric cholestasis, we have so many risk factors. First of all, uh, personal family history of the obstetric cholestasis, that is very important. Multiple pregnancy, why there is increased risk of multiple uh, obstetric cholestasis in multiple pregnancy? Because of increased hormones level. Okay, basically in the pathophysiology, the hormones of the pregnancy are responsible for the obstetric cholestasis. Another cause is that of the uh, carriage of hepatitis C and the presence of the gallstone and of the IVF treatment because hormones like progesterones are given in IVF and also in the advanced uh, maternal age. Now, how is obstetric cholestasis diagnosed? Uh, obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed when otherwise unexplained pruritus occurs in pregnancy and abnormal liver function tests or raised bile acids occurs in the pregnancy uh, in the pregnant woman and both results after delivery. Okay, so a, a very important point uh, to be considered here is that in obstetric cholestasis, the um, deranged LFTs and raised bile acids usually result after pregnancy. Okay, that is basically diagnostic of uh, obstetric cholestasis. And pruritus that is involved, the palms and soles of the feet is particularly suggestive. Okay, and pregnancy specific uh, uh, references ranges for LFTs should also be used. And other causes of the itching of and of the liver dysfunction should be excluded. Okay, so in that way, we can do the very uh, good um, diagnosis of the obstetric cholestasis. Now, in a, in another important thing is that uh, women Women with persistent pruritus and normal biochemistry should have LFT repeated, repeated after every one to two weeks. <clears throat> okay. And even after delivery, we check it. Postnatal resolution of the pruritus and abnormal LFTs should be confirmed. Okay. Because if they resolve, then uh, it means that it was obstetric cholestasis. But if they don't resolve, then we have to think about the other causes of raised LFT as well. Now, how should obstetric cholestasis be monitored? That is also a very important thing. Once obstetric cholestasis is diagnosed, it is reasonable to measure LFT weekly until delivery and postnatal LFT should be deferred for at least 10 days. Okay? Why is it important? Because uh, in the initial days, the effect of pregnancy is there. So, we have to wait for the 10 days after delivery. Now, what is the risk uh, of uh, stillbirth for pregnancies complicated by obstetric cholestasis? It's written in the guideline in that in the hospital setting, the current uh, additional risk for the stillbirth in obstetric cholestasis above that of the general population has not been determined, but is likely to be small. Okay? And what additional risks are associated 
complicated um, with pregnancy is complicated by obstetric cholestasis. It's written that obstetrician should be aware and should also advise women that the incidence of the premature birth, especially iatrogenic, is increased. Okay, so about the additional birth, uh, additional uh, risk uh, apart from stillbirth, which we explained in the previous slide, uh, there is additional risk of premature birth, both iatrogenic as well as. Um, pathological okay <clears throat> now women should be advised of increased likelihood of meconium passage that is another risk factors okay in pregnancy is affected by obstetric cholestasis and women with obstetric cholestasis should be booked in under consulted that team based care and give birth in hospital units okay so we should label these patients as high risk and all the high risk patients should be booked under consultant care now, how, uh, sorry, can fetal death be predicted and prevented? Okay, about that, uh, about this, it's written that poor outcome cannot currently be predicted by biochemical results and the delivery decision should not be based on the results alone. And no specific method of antenatal fetal monitoring for prediction of the fetal death can be recommended. Now, ultrasound and cardiotocograph are not reliable methods of, of uh, preventing fetal deaths in obstetric cholestasis. Now, it's written that at a level of bile acid, worse fetal outcome is suspected. At what level of bile acid, worse fetal outcome is suspected? About this, this it's written that for every one micromole per liter increase in bile acid level, the, uh, the risk to the fetus increases up to 1 to 2 percent. And for every 10 micromole per liter increase in bile acid level, the risk of meconium increases to 20%. Now, risk is low when the bile acid level is less than 40 micromole per liter. Now, should women with obstetric cholestasis be offered elective early birth? Now, about this, it's written that a discussion should take place with a woman regarding induction of the labor after 37 plus weeks of gestation. And delivery is indicated at 38 weeks of gestation, okay? <clears throat> so, if a woman comes at uh, uh, 37 weeks of gestation, we should discuss the option of induction of labor. And if she comes at 38 weeks, then delivery is indicated, okay? Now, women should be informed of increased risk of the perinatal morbidity from the early intervention after 37 plus weeks of gestation. Women should be informed that in case of intervention after 37 weeks of gestation may be stronger in those with a more severe biochemical abnormalities like transaminases and bile acids. And women should be informed of increased risk of the maternal morbidity from intervention at 37 plus weeks of gestation. And women should be informed of increased um, uh, inability to predict stillbirth if the pregnancy continues. Okay, so all the these things should be discussed with the, the woman, okay? Now, what treatment, if any, should be used to treat obstetric cholestasis and when, what benefits can be expected, okay? So, uh, the treatments include topical emollients and systemic treatments, okay? Topical emollients are safe, but their efficacy is unknown. Systemic treatments are aimed to at relieving pruritus, including uh, cholestyramine, a poorly tolerated bile acid chelating agents, which may improve pruritus in some women but may also exacerbate vitamin k deficiencies which has been associated with fetal intracranial hemorrhage cholestyramine has not been subjected to randomized uh, trial and is not in clinical use and antihistamines such as um, chlorphenamine may provide some welcome sedation at night but do not have a significant impact on pruritus activated charcoal and uh, Gorgum do not relieve pruritus. Now, as adenosyl methionine, there is insufficient evidence to demonstrate whether as adenosyl methionine is effective for control of maternal symptoms or for improving fetal outcomes and is not recommended. Now, also the oscicolic acid improved pruritus and liver functions in women with obstetric cholestasis. Women should be informed of the lack of robust data concerning protection against stillbirth and safety to the fetus or neonate. 
Now, what is the maximum dose of orsodeoxycholic acid? Answer is that of 2 gram per day. That is references to a article. Now, dexamethasone. Dexamethasone should not be first-line therapy for the treatment of obstetric cholestasis, nor should it be used outside the randomized control trial without thorough consultation with a woman. Now, what is the role of vitamin K? A discussion should take place with a woman regarding the use of vitamin K. Women should be advised that um, where the prothrombin time is prolonged, the use of the water soluble vitamin K, uh, mean a diol, uh, sodium phosphate in the dose of 5 to 10 mg daily is indicated and women should be advised that when prothrombin time is normal, water soluble vitamin K, mean a diol, sodium phosphate in low doses should be used only after careful counseling about the likely benefit but small theoretical risk. Now, why specifically water soluble vitamin K is given? That is also a very important question. It's not written clearly in the guideline. But the answer is that it's because liver is already compromised in obstetric cholestasis, so fat soluble vitamin K will not be absorbed properly. Okay, now what, what follow-up should be offered to the women who have had pregnancies affected by obstetric cholestasis? Now, women should be offered follow-up with the healthcare professionals with necessary skills and expertise to provide appropriate counseling and to ensure that the LFTs have returned to normal. Now about follow-up, it's written that provide appropriate counseling and ensure that LFTs have returned to normal. Recurrence rate is 45 to 90%. So remember this point. Now contraceptive choices, you have to avoid estrogen containing methods, increase incidence of the obstetric cholestasis in family members and LFTs at six weeks and after delivery and um, an appointment eight weeks is a suggested model. Okay, so thank you so much.